Hi, this is Gavin from Haverstick Designs, and this is The Sound Project. All right, so I'm really excited today. I get to sit down with TJ. Hi. TJ Beachill from Neat. Gavin, how you doing? Thanks I'm for doing, having me. I'm doing great. Um, it's, it's a cool day. We've been filming with a bunch of friends and people right. coming into the office to actually do this, which we've never done before. And... Uh, Man, it's it's just so so cool that you came down from Fort Wayne and and joined us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, I mean we've been working together for years and I've heard about this office, so it's really cool to finally be here and, and to be on the podcast. This yeah. is I think my second podcast ever. So, oh, second. What was the first one? Uh, I did. You, know, you would ask me that. Um, <laughs> I'll get back to you on that. I'm trying to remember. Oh no, it was with a customer of mine, Jason. It was just it was years ago. He just wanted to talk to me about my process going through Sweetwater, and I had just left Sweetwater going into Neat, mm -hmm. and we were talking about that. But yeah, this is a, second one. This is going to be a good one. Well, we're, I'm excited. We're, for we are honored. So, um, well, yeah, we have known each other for a long time. Um, I, tell a little bit to our listeners, like um, your history, kind of your whole path. Everybody has a story of how they got to where they are. Like, what's yours? Right. So it's a. Uh, it's an interesting one that starts at Sweetwater. But what's interesting about my Sweetwater story is I'm probably the only person that works there that grew up wanting to work there. And that's <laughs> not a stab at Sweetwater, but I, yeah. I, just, I don't think most, like, 16-year-olds, like, I want to work at a music store. Yeah. But that was actually kind of my thing. I, was, uh, I will say there's one other, and he works for me, Ryan. Oh, that's awesome. Ryan had the same story. Like, he, he, he wanted to work at Sweetwater. Well, that's great. See, I'm glad <laughs> I'm not the only one. But, you know, as, as a kid, we grew up uh, in a small town in Ohio. Didn't have a lot of music stores. My dad wanted he wanted to buy a Taylor 914. It's a nice acoustic. Mm -hmm. And uh, our local shop didn't stock them and uh, told us that we need to go to check out this place in Indiana called Sweetwater. Mm -hmm. So my dad, I was like, I think it was like it was a family trip. I think for some reason, which you see all the time at Sweetwater, but I, I realized not we were that family. Yeah, you know, all excited. <laughs> Yay! Uh, but yeah, we we made it to uh, to the original Bass Road location, and I was just blown away. Uh, yeah. Adam Crampton, he was my sales engineer. He still works there. Yeah. Um, and he gave my dad and I and my family the, the tour. We checked out the recording studio, checked out the store. And in that moment, I just looked at my dad. It's like I was in heaven. I was like, yeah. oh, they have all the cool stuff. They have the recording studio. So I was like, dad, I'm going to work here when I grow up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to the University of St. Francis in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which was a music technology program that was actually curated by Sweetwater, yeah. um, which was cool. I mean, we saw like the inner workings of Sweetwater the entire time we were going through university. University. And uh, so I did my senior year of college, I did a year's worth of an internship. Half of it was in the recording studio. And then the second half was actually in the retail sales floor, uh, which they had never done and probably will never do again. <laughs> <laughs> it's just they have a lot of complex systems. So to throw a college kid in with no idea, it, it was interesting to say the least. But yeah. anyway, I uh, graduated college, started working at Sweetwater two days later. And uh, when I started, I was that first wave of, you know, young, every school didn't have a music technology program at that time. It was like right. Full Sail, MI, and there was like Berkeley, but it wasn't at that point yet where every university had a music tech program. So there wasn't a lot of people just graduating college and going to Sweetwater. Sweetwater traditionally hired people with either an extensive background in the industry or touring professionals, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I was really young when I started working there and I kind of looked at Sweetwater and took my business to a, a, a different level. And I re primarily ran most of my business through texting and social media. Mm -hmm. I ended up actually creating the Instagram account for Sweetwater. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's I, crazy. I had told them years ago, I was like, you guys need an Instagram account. And they're like, okay, if you want to do that so bad, do it. Yeah. And uh, Christopher Guerin and I, he worked in marketing. Him and I ran it for about a year. And then Steve Dwyer came and picked it up. But anyway, um, all this to say, I had shaped a unique business about finding studio guys because that was like my world. I was a studio engineer. I had a studio at my house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was finding clients through referrals, through social media, through hashtags, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it was I, I was a sales engineer for... I think two and a half, almost three years. And then my wife and I were uh, watching MTV. We don't watch a lot of TV. So it was like this whole thing was just like right place, right time kind of thing. Um, we're watching MTV. It's, this thing's called Ones to Watch. It was a MTV award show, but they brought in a newer artist that, could, yeah. that they were trying to give the spotlight to. Mm -hmm. And it was a band called 21 Pilots. Mm -hmm. And they just put on, they played a song called Holding On To You. They had ski masks on, whatever. And it was just like, really captivating and my wife and I are like oh, these, these guys are 
kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I love the I love the performance they put on. So I had went to Sweetwater the next day, and I was like, I wonder if anyone at Sweetwater works with them. Mm-hmm. And they didn't. We didn't have records for Tyler or Josh or any of the crew that I could find by just Googling them. And uh, so I ended up just Googling who their front of house engineer is, thinking this is going to be easier to reach out to than the artist. And I find him on Facebook. I sent him a message. I said, hey, I'm TJ. I work at Sweetwater. Saw your show last night. Would love to hook you guys up with gear if you'd like. And yeah. he sent a message back. And he's like, hey, you know, we would love to work together. Um, and it just it snowballed, like, really quick. Like, first week, we're just setting, like, drumsticks. And I remember I, they actually came to Sweetwater. The front of house engineer did. He had a fader that broke on his console, and we fixed it there. Even though he didn't buy it from us, I just told him, I'm like, hey, I'm trying to grow this account, take care of him. Yeah. So we did. And uh, it was four months into the relationship where um, they they were out with Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy. Mm-hmm. This has got to be 2012, 13, maybe, mm-hmm. at this time. And uh, their computer, this uh, 2012, 13, where you actually have computers that had physical spinning hard drives, and mm-hmm. it wasn't solid state. Sure. And you could grab a laptop back in that day and, and shake it, and it would go into safety mode. It would mm-hmm. shut down so the hard drive wouldn't skip. And all this to say, their stage went dark. Stage went dark in front of ten thousand people. Whatever. <laughs> How many people were there? It was it was a, it was an arena show, so it was a lot. So I got a phone call like three o'clock in the morning from the front of house engineer. He's like, "Do you know how to ba- build playback redundancy systems?" I'm like, "Oh, of course, total lie." <laughs> and you did. Uh, no, I'm just sitting there googling the playback redundancy systems. Yeah, I, I can figure this out. And he's like, "Good, I need you to build one, and I need you to ship it to me in like two days." And wow. I'm, and it was again like three o'clock in the morning. He calls me. I'm like, "All right," and, and I'm, I'll never forget. He's like, "This is what separates the men from the boys." <laughs> and he hangs up, and I look at my wife. I'm like. Am I a boy? Or? I was like, what, was like, what did I just get myself into? But, you know, power of Google, we figured it out. And um, all this to say, this, I mean, that moment was you, you, you go back in your life and you think, how many times did you make a decision that changed the rest of your life? Right. And I'm not saying that that moment might be something I remember on my deathbed. But at, at this point, it, probably it, will be. It, was a big, yeah. it was a big pivotal moment in my life because what had happened was, this is right before Blurry Face came out, which was their album that just took them to the moon, right? Yeah. Um, and what had happened is we built their playback rig, and they toured with so many bands that were kind of in that same point in their career where mm-hmm. you know, the next move was going to take off for them. So as soon as I built 21's playback rig, all of a sudden I had every band that they were touring with coming to me. I was like, hey, we saw that rig. Can you do one for us? And right. So in one one moment, I went from working in my home studio, uh, you know, at home, and then being a studio focused guy on social media to instantly pivoting to building playback redundancy systems, and I changed my business for Sweetwater to be touring. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was like, okay, this is actually cool selling to people who buy every single day and live off of the equipment that you're selling to them. And it's not a stab at like hobbyist studios, but like. You know, you save up, you buy a piece of gear, and you hold on to that until you get to the next one, right? Yeah. But with like touring, you're buying every single day, and you're making a living with the gear that you're you're yeah. using. So it was a there was a lot of business happening quickly as soon as I pivoted into the touring scene, and then playback rigs at the time, you know, they were unobtainable. And then iConnectivity comes out with this like five hundred dollar, um, it's six ninety nine now. Update, <laughs> but uh, sorry, I got to got to shout out inflation there. Um, but yeah, it was the first time that it was an affordable way for everyone to have playback rigs, mm-hmm. and it was like overnight, my phone's just blowing up. Yeah. So this gets to 2018. I have 300 national touring acts that I'm either selling or building for, and you know, it was interesting. You and I, not to go back too far, but you know, throughout the years, you and I had known each other through. All yeah. the Sweetwater University classes, and you were always there. Mm-hmm. But it was weird that I had taken such a uh, kind of a hard turn from doing all my studio work to then getting into live and then coming back into studio. We'll get there in a second. Yeah. But anyway, in 2018, what happened was uh, it was it got to a point where 21 needed me to come out and do rehearsals with them, and I had to leave for a month. And I had wow. just had another kid, so I had all of my vacation time was gone. And this, it was just building to this point because prior to 2018, every single weekend I'd clock out at six and I was in a car going out to a gig or going home to build a rig for somebody or hopping on a plane and going out to a show. Sure. So for, you know, three to, you know, three to five years prior to 2018, I hadn't been home at all in any capacity. (laughs) Right. Um, So 
when this moment presented itself to say, hey, you know, is it time to leave Sweetwater? Is it time to create your own thing? It became real. So uh, we created Neat in 2018 and I left Sweetwater to focus on building playback rigs, going out and not touring, but being there for support in the preliminary stages of a tour. Yeah. Like we would show up to rehearsals to make sure everything that we built is working. And then I will always like sprinkle in shows uh, mid tour just to see, make sure everything is working and holding up correctly, but then also talk about, hey, what are we doing next? Yeah. In one of those moments is how you and I started working together because we were in rehearsals with Tyler uh, for 21. This was right after Blurry Face. He was he was getting done with Blurry Face, and he's like, hey, I, I do – I mean, they toured that album. Two and a half years or something yeah. like that, right? and they never stopped. And so he's like, I, I have to create another album, and I do not want to do this on the road. You know, Blurry Face was tracked all over the country in different studios, and mm-hmm. they worked with a bunch of different people to get that album done. And Tyler's like, I just, I just want to work from home. Right. So uh, I remember he, at the time he had asked a front of house engineer, he's like, hey, uh, I want to build a studio. What do you know? And Shane, who was the front of house engineer at the time, he's like, oh, you got to talk to TJ about that. That's his thing. Yeah. So Tyler came to me. He's like, hey, I want to build a studio. And I was like, I got you. I actually felt comfortable with that one. Like I, I playback rigs, that was shocking. But like studios, that was that was just like yeah. in the back of my brain, something I never let go of. And you know, even though I had primarily focused on building playback rigs and stuff in the entire time at Sweetwater, I still had my studio guys. Right. So uh, yeah, twenty. I don't even know what, what year was it that it was we did. Actually, twenty seventeen when we started yeah, that. Yeah, when we started yep. it. Yeah. Because I, I, I remember Could have been late two thousand sixteen. I remember I was still at Sweetwater when we did the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, but any, you know, I'll say that when at my time at Sweetwater, you, you meet a lot of, I, I want to build a recording studio. And that conversation goes two ways. It's either an artist looking to build a studio for to cater to their needs, or it is someone building a commercial recording studio that needs to cater to a lot of people's needs, to sure. say everyone, but that's a broad stroke. But yeah. I noticed quickly that there are two different kinds of recording studios. You can walk in and say, okay, this is weird, and it might be just absolutely perfect for the person working here, but there's also studios you walk in and it's like, this has got a little bit of everything so anybody can walk in and make an album. Right. I love working on the artistry level and on the artist level of this because I get to tailor what I know about gear to make sure that it fits the process and what the artist needs. Yeah. Um, but more important than that, I think you need to be in a space that is – inviting and uh what's the word i'm looking for a creative yeah, inspiring inspiring yeah. yeah that's the word that's, yeah. uh, that's the word so i knew after working with you for years at sweetwater it's like okay i know someone who is going to listen to every single request we have and that's why i've always enjoyed working with you because yeah. you know you walk through some studios and you're like tell almost who builds it i can't walk through a single one of your studios and know that <laughs> this was you know your fingerprint right. uh, because you're you're literally just doing whatever the artist needs so that was that was critical for me, and mm-hmm. we did Tyler Studio, which was, which was a ton of fun. Yeah, that that call when you you, I think over the years, I think a few times you had reached out and saying like, I think someday like we probably do a studio for Twenty One Pilots, and uh, you know, but then when you called and said Tyler was ready to do this, um, and it was very exciting to me. Like one, uh, like we had done a, a lot of cool projects, but this was a this was a big big one for us. Um, but also the fact that like my niece loved 21 pilots <laughs> you know and then uh she actually the year before we we worked on that project together she dressed as tyler for halloween and stuff like that it's just wild um and you know liz like she uh, she just uh was so excited that we were working with an artist that she liked you know right. and, and uh um and so I, when i got that call i got very excited about the project and then went to hear about the scope about how he wanted to do it from home and I remember originally you sent me a picture. I think that we were just texting back and forth of some things, and you sent me a picture of where he wanted to put the studio. Right. Which most people don't know much about that, but it's like <laughs> it, it was a room that wasn't well suited to be a studio. Like it, it could have been, it could have worked out fine, except right. there was, you know, future plans of maybe starting a family and things like that. And this right. room would have been close to uh, maybe a child's room and i was like you don't want that isolation issue you know i remember the windows and it was funny i, I literally just needs five-year anniversary was last week yeah and i had sent awesome. congrats I had, by the way i was just reminiscing on things and i had sent tyler a picture of us in because we, when we were building the studio we had the temporary space yep. above in that loft and i remember we didn't do the loft because a of isolation from the rest of the house of the kids and then the windows yeah which is ironically why which we is what up. he wants now yeah. <laughs> what we move for but yeah. uh yeah that that room was just 
fascinating to work in. But again, what was cool is just sitting down and having such a blank slate. You didn't come in having any agenda. It Mm -hmm. was just like, what do you want? Yeah. And it's interesting. I think some of the artists that I've worked with in the past, you ask them what they want and all they can do is just show you pictures of other people's studios. Right. I don't think a lot of people inherently think, well, this is what I've always envisioned my studio to be. They always just inspire from other people's studios. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of interesting in Tyler's element that, you know, it was kind of, you asked him what he wanted and he's like, all right, he turned it over to his wife. Yeah, that was, that, I remember we were sitting uh, in that like kind of theater room of his and, and we were all sitting around that table and, and yeah, we were like, well, what do you want this to be like? And yeah, I mean, you tell the story great about that kind of, I, I was shocked because normally people, the artist you, and Tyler, so, um, uh, you know, he's always thinking about the aesthetic and different parts of things. I figured that he would just have it locked down about what right. he wanted, but what he yeah. actually did. Yeah, I, I, I didn't see it coming. He had never alluded to this, but the story was that when he was getting to the point of engaging, getting engaged to his, his now wife, he had asked his wife, what kind of wedding ring do you want? Mm-hmm. And she said, I want you to pick out a ring for me. And I'm sure, I, I think it was like he custom made this ring uh, sure. and went through builders, whatever. So he's like, I've been waiting for a moment to get back at her for this. <laughs> so when we got to the design element of the studio, we asked, we asked him, I was like, hey, okay, so what do you want this to look like? And he, yeah. he hit the, the smile on his face. I'll never forget yeah. it because it was just absolutely I, – I called my wife on the way home. I was like, I would never yeah. let you build my <laughs> studio. No disrespect, but I'm like, man, I have a million ideas. But what was fun with him is he's like, I'm completely turning it over. Yeah. So then you and your team worked so hard with uh, with Jenna and then the, the designer from yeah. the tri, uh, tri-phase. Tri-phase, yeah. Uh, and, and what was great, too, is that that moment of him saying – I know it's kind of like a getting back at her, but it was a sweet moment. Oh, like it, it, was, it, yeah. it was like it was really cool of like, you know, he that meant so much to her, and then he the studio means so much to him to have her have control over it. So, like we, we worked with Triphase Technologies, um, uh, they, they're uh, out of here, like around Indianapolis, Zionsville area, um, and so we had to do it kind of uh, from afar with uh, since we're not. Right. We're three hours away from Columbus, uh, but they traveled. They, uh, you know, worked. You know, not only on the design with us, but then they constructed the whole thing too. And we didn't have uh, the timeline was was strict. It was strict. <laughs> yeah, I think from the time the first time I went there till finished studio, it was two and a half months, which is uh, we did that in two and a half months. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going yeah. back to that, I, I I've. How did we do that? I don't know. I, and, well, in, in two and a half months, I mean, I know you you travel to Columbus all the time for them, but I think I made ten trips to Columbus in in two and a half months, and we, yeah. you know, there was just uh, so we we took that loft space and we kind of crossed that off the list of saying like we're, we don't want to build here, but we did it in the basement instead. Right. And uh, I remember early designs that we did. It, there was a. Uh, I had a control room, then I had a vocal booth there as well, because I kind of doing the traditional thing that we do. Um, And then I remember at one point, Tyler just looked at me and said, like, I will never use that booth. Right. He's like, I, and you know their process. He's like cutting vocals at at the mix position, holding the microphone a lot of times. (laughs) So, um, so he's like, I will never get up and leave and go to another room to track vocals. And so we took that out of the plan. We ended up arriving at just like a one large room for him to do everything in. And, uh, you know, I like the large room for the low frequency response of the, of the space and uh, um, also put a piano there in the back and he just had room to hang out and just it's a real cool, comfortable space. It was cool. I, I, I remember going through the design elements with someone on his team and he, he almost dismissed me. He's like, hey, you know, you really shouldn't build like a square room. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was a large rectangle, and yeah. I had to explain to him. I was like, "Hey, there's not going to be a vocal booth, and this is not going to be like a segmented room. And like yeah. the purpose of this is one room will do it all. Yeah. And he's going to sit and track vocals at his desk, holding his microphone, possibly in his hand. Right. And uh, you know, to explain that to so many people, they're just like, "What? Yeah. And it was confusing. I was like, again, there are so many studios you walk into. And you'll spend 45 minutes just trying to plug in an auxiliary cord <laughs> and trying to get the pen to the paper is a process. You yeah. know, I've walked into countless studios. I'm like, okay, an hour in, I'm finally ready to start recording. But now I'm tired because I had to get there. <laughs> right. The whole idea with that studio was to just build something he could walk in. And we always, I, I always use these same firm and power sequencers that relays. One key turns on the entire studio and then it was just plug and play. Microphone yeah. was sitting on the desk. 
uh, on a mouse pad to his left, and then he had his keyboard and sense to his right and mm-hmm. gear right to his left. He could sit in a single square and operate the entire studio, yeah. and it was it was fantastic. I've got a, a couple photos here um, that I can show. There's the first one here of of Tyler. I always tell people like. I promise you he's enjoying it right now. <laughs> he looks very serious, but um, he really uh, loves the studio. But, yeah, here's the, the setup. I mean, and one of the first things we had to do, because uh, we both really like clean setups, and Tyler also was just like, I don't want to see cables yeah. uh, running everywhere. And um, I always think it's funny that the uh, first thing we did in the studio that he was going to write the new album in was Dig a Trench. Yeah. Which, <laughs> This is the name. I, never, I never thought about that. Yeah, this is the name of the album, which we had nothing to do with, of course. Like, no. But it's just kind of a funny coincidence. We actually took the a jackhammer, and I say we like I did anything. No, I, I wasn't, didn't do anything. We weren't but, there for that. But uh, Triphase, like, jackhammered up the, the floor, um, and just a elaborate... Um, array of, of conduit that we did that ran to the desk, ran to the gear, ran to the um, uh, the synths, and then also we have soffit mounted speakers, uh, the ATC 110s in there, and then also a set of uh, Focal SM9s, yep. and so all these conduit runs perfectly to the legs of these these devices, and then that way it just pops straight up, and you don't see cables anywhere, which is is beautiful. That was know? such a. I remember all of the drawings and designs that we did for cable management yeah and what was interesting as soon as it was done i'm like that's not at all what i was thinking (laughs) but it i mean it actually all worked yeah but i remember we were just gonna do like straight lines to each thing and then uh uh, maybe we can get a photo of the conduit in here just we're talking about it so much we can add it but i I vividly remember telling tyler because that's that's just something like at, at my house and in like my personal life i hate seeing cables i hate walking around cables yeah just and when i told him that i'm like hey just by the way, like there will be a point when I obsess over this, and he's like, "I love that <laughs> yeah. about you that yeah. you hate seeing cables." Because he's like, "I'm kind of, you know, I just like cleanliness. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be able to walk into a room and not have to worry about a cable across the floor. Right. You know, I just want to get to work, you know." Mm-hmm. And for some reason, my mind looks at the cable. I'm like, oh, "I got to clean that up." Yeah. So yeah, the 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 trench. God, I never even thought about yeah, that. I can't believe you haven't thought about that. Yeah. Never connected that. But yeah, <laughs> the trench was quite the undertaking, but at the end of the day. I made mean, everything clean. Yeah, it and, made it neat. And, and the thing, <laughs> yes, it did make it neat. <laughs> the uh, the thing was is that a lot of times we'll run the conduit underneath a floated floor. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem in here is that with a basement, you inherently you typically don't have a lot of ceiling height. Right. And if we were to raise the floor six inches, plus what we needed to do on the ceiling to isolate it properly, um, we would have ended up with a, a, a ceiling height of probably under eight feet. And right. we didn't want that. Like the finished ceiling height in here um, ended up being eight foot nine when we were all finished. And uh, um, But it was it, since we didn't float the floor, uh, normally that gives us a path to run the conduit. The only way was down, you know, right. and, and so we had to jackhammer up the, the concrete and place it. But ended up just working. Working out really nicely, you know that was kind of the first phase. Then we were building the room within a room uh, to try to isolate it. I remember having conversations with Tyler early on, where um, one of the things was like, "Well, what about the sounds from above? Because anyone's walking on the hardwood above, I hear it down here." And, and uh, you know, thinking in the future about maybe kids running up and down that hallway that's right above the studio. And the thing I told him is that. Unfortunately, the only way to address that is to do an underlayment in the floor above. Right. Like, you know, building this room within a room is helpful, but it's not going to completely cut that out. But taking up the floor of the whole, you know, area yeah. above was not going to be something we did. And so he was okay with that. Um, uh, but, yeah, the isolation ended up working really well in there. Um, we, we had... Um, I mean, I'd say the biggest challenge on this project was just really the time, the timing yeah. of things. I mean in comparison to other projects that we work on that sometimes take six months, nine months, a year. Um, this was two and a half months from start to finish. And, and, uh, you know, it, and, and it's something where, you know, he had, he could work without the studio, right. but really to get started on that new album, it needed to, needed to be done. Um, so, um, I mean, what, what was for you on a technology side of things? Like what was the biggest challenge for you on this job? Well, it's, it's more or less just making sure you're getting the right gear uh, to fit his needs. Uh, again, my biggest concern when I'm addressing a studio, because I, honestly, I feel like I give all the hard stuff to you. <laughs> no. uh, you know, for me, it's just making sure that I'm giving the artist the right tools. And Tyler and Josh both have been very uh, kind to me to just give me free reign, basically, of over like, hey, 
do whatever you think I, I need and mm-hmm. want in my studio. And obviously we address like, okay, what kind of sounds are we going for from a synthesis standpoint? And we have that conversation, but from like a, you know, a, a vocal chain and conversion and all that stuff, it was always just kind of like, do what you think I need. And, yeah. you know, the scope of the project was massive to end up with pretty much the ability to record two channels, I think, in the studio. Right. You know, we had a Lynx Aurora at the time. It was eight channels. Mm-hmm. We had one BAE 1073 and one Neve Portico that we ended up using for ukulele. Yeah. Those were the only mic- recordable mic channels at the end of the day. Right. And then we had his two synthesizers, a MIDI controller, and then we ended up putting the piano in the back later. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of hilarious. You, you, you think about dedicating you know, two, almost three months of your life mm-hmm. into building this massive project. And at the end of the day, when you know you're talking to your audio friends, they're like, "Oh, what console did you put in?" I'm like, mm, nah. yeah. I was like, "Oh, how many how many channels can I record?" I was like, ah, it's, again, that's not what it's for. That's not what it's for. So yeah. it's hilarious to think like I, I'm pretty sure I was there almost every weekend mm-hmm. because it's, it's just a massive undertaking to make sure again because of the limited time frame we had, having to make sure that every single thing was being done right. Right. And I was learning a lot at the time because this was your and I's first project and kind mm-hmm. of again being remote. Yeah. You know, work my my relationship with studios for uh, I mean years working at Sweetwater was you talk to a customer you make sure they get everything they want you ship it and just you know I mean you realistically just hoping that it's as good as you told them it was gonna be. Right. This was that first studio where I was there every single weekend like mm-hmm. is it as good as I said it was gonna be and luckily it turned out to be a fantastic studio and I love that room so much. Yeah. Um, I remember one one the night that we were dialing in. Uh, do you remember when when Tyler came to us and said? I want it to sound the same at the mix position as it does six feet back right. where he would stand and, and play bass. Right. Um, and that's that's obviously a challenge because like every room, like if you move forward and backwards in your room at home while you're playing music, you're, you're going to notice a big difference as you're moving because the uh, relationship between the speakers and your listening position changes. And um, But we were playing around a lot with a JPL, a JBL intonato. Um, and we were taking acoustical measurements and then making EQ adjustments to try to come up with settings and scenes that he could switch when he moved back uh, to play bass to where it would still sound similar to what it did when he was sitting. It surprises me how many people that I talk to about that studio don't do that. And maybe that's something, maybe it's just my lack of involvement in a lot of studios these days, but we did that with Josh's too, Mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, the mix position is great, but what if I have somebody on the couch in the back of the room? How's that experience? And then, of course, you know, I don't think anyone's ever talked about this, but the mirror that you're seeing in the photo right there, that was put up because Trench was the album that Tyler learned really to be a front man with the bass in his hands. Yeah. So he didn't want to learn how to play bass looking down. He put the mirror there so he could stare and look how he was playing and yeah. learning how to play that way. Yeah. But at the same time, that's when he made the, you know, the comments. Like the mix position changes dramatically. So we had to change and create those EQ curves. So as he moved back, the system would change with him. Yeah. And we explained that to people and they're like, what? That's crazy. Because I think <laughs> most people just focus on the mix position. Sure. But it's like again but it's at I the artist it, level, and I think that goes back to like what it's being used for, because some people wouldn't have that that uh, that idea to to make them sound the same. And and for Tyler, I think it, honestly for him, he was just like, man, that'd be really cool if that could happen. Like right. he didn't know that that's out of the ordinary from what right. we typically do. So it is weird talking to artists. It's like, okay, hey, you need to buy a speaker. Nowadays, when I'm talking to artists, I'm like, well, let's buy speakers with DSP, and they're like, why? So okay, a we can treat the room mm-hmm. easily, but b we can create mix positions in different mm-hmm. environments for the room. And it's, I'm, I don't know, maybe again, maybe I'm just naive, but I think this is a kind of a unique thought for people to create multiple positions in one room. Sure. Cause I think everyone's just focusing on the mix position. Yeah. Right, really. That's usually the case. <laughs> yep. Um, I remember when we, that night when we finally got it fixed and, and Tyler came down, I tell this story all the time. He, uh, he sat down at the mix position. He played a reference track, which, um, I don't know if you remember what the... Do you remember the first... Bruno? No, the first track he played in, it was No Diggity. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first track he played in the studio. But he, he listens to it, and then he listened to a couple more things, and he hadn't said anything. And right. I was just kind of nervous, because mm-hmm. I was like, this is like the two and a half months culminating to this moment. Right. And I remember he was looking and listening, and then he just said, oh, no. And I, I freaked out, because I was like, what is it, Tyler? I was like, what's wrong? And he goes... 
I'm the weak link now. That's what he said. <laughs> he's like, that. he's like, I, I hear things because he played a couple of tracks that he was working on. I think it was actually uh, Nico and the Niners he was playing at the oh. time, and um, he's just like, I hear things that I need to fix because yeah. I never heard it before in the rooms that I was in before. So it was like at the moment, it was like very nerve wracking, and I was right. like, what, what is wrong? Uh, but it actually ended up being a compliment. Like right. he was like, yeah, this room is is working out great. That was a long night. I think different. you left at like 2.30 in the morning. You had to go somewhere the next day because I remember yeah. we started at like 9 and I think we finished at 2 and I, I remember feeling bad for you. No, it's all right. Yeah, I, I think I got home around like uh, 6 in the morning or something like that. <laughs> but I felt better getting home at 6 in the morning with good feedback uh, right. You know, from Tyler. He was, he was loving the room. So, um, yeah, and then, and I mean, he spent a lot of time in that space, you know, writing that, that new record. And um, I remember, I mean, it was something where we didn't really talk about the fact that we did the studio for a long time. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, a couple, year. A year or so, so afterwards. And then I remember uh, when um, Trench had come out and then they did that video for My Blood. Right. And he was in the studio. That was the first time it, it came out. It was the first time it was seen. And yeah. I, I got really excited about it and that it was actually in a music video. I'm pretty sure you text me. I, I did. Was like, did you yeah. see this? Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that was fun. Yeah, it's super fun. But yeah, so he, I got a couple more photos of the, of the room. Like the back of the room here, we've got um, some diffusers uh, on the back wall that are built into a bass trap. Um, bass traps in the corners, around the perimeter and the soffits. I uh, got those reflectors on the ceiling uh, that, that um, uh, allow for when he this picture doesn't have the the grand piano in there but he ended up putting that in in that space and helps to redirect the sound i uh, got a couple pictures of the front here uh with tyler at the at the synth station and at the mix position there and and yeah just one of those rooms where it's just super comfortable walking in like even you come down the basement and you walk down that hallway and then you turn and you're like not something you'd expect to see in somebody's house right so yeah i, I miss that studio a lot yeah. I'm assuming we're going to transition yeah. into the next one now, right? Yeah, the next one. So after two albums, he did Trench and Scaled and Icy in that space. Um, and he came to you and, and said he, he wanted to do something different. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he had had his kid. Or I think he had, he had both, both of his daughters. Yeah. Both. So he had, he had two daughters at the time. And he's, you know, ironically, we didn't care that he could hear somebody walking up above. But when he hears his daughter run down the hallway, he's like, I'm just having a hard time focusing. So yeah. he wanted a separate space to be able to work. That and then the basement studio, he's, you know, there was no windows down there. He's mm -hmm. like, I'm just, he, he loves the outdoors. So he's like, I really want something with more visibility. And I'm like, okay, cool. We can find a space with some windows. Which is ironic because then we went to a room with no windows to having then 17. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, I'll never forget, you know, we, we had done a walkthrough through the house uh, before he had actually bought it to see if it was a viable space. And you just walk in and you just take a deep breath, realizing it's like, all right, we got a challenge. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, we'll, we'll go back into this a little bit more, but I'll never forget, like, even when the room is done, it is still more lively than, you know, mm -hmm. the basement studio. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I, I can tell you that, he, he feels like it's changing, you know, the kind of songs that he's writing, writing because it's more lively. Yeah. And I had to explain to him, I was like, don't forget, like, Heathens was tracked in hotel rooms and tour buses and, you know, others, you've you've done more in, in worse environments. So I remember I showed him Under the Bridge from Red Hot Chili Peppers. Mm -hmm. I've got the stems from that, and you're just listening, you can hear people walking around in the room and Anthony Keat has never took his like breaths out yeah. you can hear his chains that he's wearing and then uh, another one that is just amazing to listen to is uh, Superstitions from Stevie Wonder mm -hmm. I mean the horn section is literally talking the entire recording <laughs> you can literally oh how's your day blah 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 you can just hear him laughing and I was like alright count in and then they start ripping and yeah. I'm like explaining to him I'm like you've worked in perfect You've had an acoustically perfect room and everything has been like a vocal booth ready like sound. Mm -hmm. This space is inspiring you. And as an artist, that's something you should focus on. But I like it took a minute to just tell him, like, you're going to have live sound in this room that you're not used to. But right. you also don't need to, like, focus on that, that being a bad thing. Right. And I was like in the scope of an overall mix, these little nuances are not going to be the thing that people are focusing on. No. But this room now that he's working in, which he's finding a ton of inspiration in, is also changing the kind of songs that he's writing because it's a little bit more lively. That's interesting because I was always wondering about the basement studio, how much that impacted writing an album like Trench. It just right. felt 
Trench feels like that basement studio. Like <laughs> it just does to me. And and yeah, I'm always curious to see what this next one's uh, going to be like because he's it's such a different space. I mean, it couldn't be more opposite. Um, it goes from kind of dark, uh, you know, uh, no windows in a basement to a sunroom that right. got converted to <laughs> to a, a studio. And um, you know, I remember when I first went there, like this was before I think he had closed on the house and we were just going to look at you, right. you're there too. And, and I was doing some isolation measurements and because we were going to potentially try to isolate it better because with all those windows, that's a weak point for sound just right. to escape. And, and ultimately we didn't end up doing any construction because it, it wasn't that, that big of a deal for him. Um, but the windows were a challenge because I, I was recommending like some curtains over the windows, right. you know, that he could open and close as needed. Um, but that was another thing. He's like, that kind of defeats the purpose of having all this glass, you know? So um, <clears throat> we did end up treating it with, you know, there's panels between the windows. There's these big ceiling clouds that the contractor built um, in the in the back of the room here. There's the, the Flex 48s from Acoustical Fulfillment on the back wall. Yeah, like which what, has, six of those? There's, yeah, six of those back there. And then there's there's the, the shields get added in and they add bass trapping and diffusion to the room. And then there's some diffusers on the, on the back above where the piano are uh, that you see in the photo here in black. And uh, there are some some gobos. There's a couple like Orlex Pro Maxes that are back mm -hmm. here. He can move around and and be able to to kind of uh, isolate himself a little bit better, or get a little bit more control. But you know, overall, um, I think I think it's really good that it's a very different space for him because yeah. like two albums in a row in that studio in the basement, and then being able to come here, I, I bet it's like a totally different experience. Oh, it's night and day difference. Yeah, it's, and the two rooms are remarkably different. But again, he's happier. So, and it's, it's, he always gives me a hard time because I always get like sad about tearing it apart. We were moving all the equipment from the basement over to the new studio. And yeah, I, I gave him a hard time. I was like, this is, this is like sad. This is like a <laughs> yeah. chapter of my life, God. Right. And uh, I'm just excited for him to find a space that he loves working in because, I mean, that's when that's what you do for a living. You yeah. Know? You want to be happy where you work. So, yeah, exactly. uh, I'm, I'm stoked for him. That project turned out great. And it's, uh, I'm just happy to see it as a workable space because the first time we walked through this, I was like, no. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I, when I first arrived, too, I was a little. I I think I was honestly more concerned about the isolation piece right. because, like, with that many windows, I was yeah, all the low ends just gonna fly out of this right. room. Um, it turned out, luckily, we didn't have to do a whole lot on that front, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is a, a different space, but I, it sounds like he's adapting to it. He's using it a ton and and uh, right. and uh, enjoying it. So, cool. So that's the Tyler uh, cycle that we went through, right. and then that led to um, kind of in parallel with the sunroom was happening at the same time. Uh, you had introduced me to, to Josh uh, Dunn, and and uh, it was time to do a studio for him. Yeah, and well, that was fun. Yeah, it was super fun. He, you know, we. He was looking for a new house and, and um, you know, a big part of that, obviously, with what he does for a living is like he wanted to have a studio in the house. And uh, so I actually toured a few houses with him that he was considering, which is honestly a weird situation to be in, like touring a house with Josh and his <laughs> wife, Debbie, and like kind of saying things that might impact where they end up living. Right. You know, it's like because of a studio. Um, but, you know, this house in, in the Columbus area that he found um, almost had like a ready-made area for a studio in the basement. That cracks me up when he sent me the photo and there was a drum set in the room. I'm yeah. like, Josh, There's it's already just me a drum meant set. to be. I loved it because the previous owners said like, well, this is this is great for you because this is a fully soundproofed, uh, this is a fully soundproofed drum room. <laughs> and like, the <laughs> there was panels on the wall and then like an inch air gap under the door. Yeah. And I mean, you could hear the drums like you were in the room, but... But, you know, it, it's, it was cool to see, like, a drum set in there, and then you could kind of visualize where a control room could be. And then there's this little alcove where, like, a vocal booth just perfectly fit. And right. so, um, you know, this studio, we actually have, like, a full, you know, YouTube uh, uh, video on it. Like, both uh, Haversick Designs has one and Sweetwater has one as well, which we'll link in the description for this. Because it's really fun to s see that video because there's a lot of conversation about why we did what we did and then photos of the construction and, and all sorts of things. But uh, this was not two and a half months. No, um, no, this one was, this was roughly seven, seven or eight months. Yeah, some, when it really got going. I mean, but from the time I, I toured the first house oh, to yeah. finished, it was two years. Yeah, yeah I forgot but, about that. But, but the actual construction time, like, yeah, seven or eight months or so. And um, one thing that was really fun with this space is just like how... Um, 
creative we could be with it. And right. Josh and Debbie are just creative people in general. Um, and I love it when people allow us to take risks and try different things. And, um, you know, the, the drum room in particular, you know, looking at a photo of it here, um, it's 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 something right that's, it's, that's it's awesome. like it's its own thing and and it's uh, uh got artwork on the entire walls it's printed on fabric so that it allows the acoustical treatment behind it to still do its job um but they have this this room above uh which i'll, I'll show here um a, a room above the drum room that was painted by these famous artists uh dabs myla from australia and when he said he was doing that uh, uh, on the on the room above, it's got twenty five foot ceilings, just amazing amazing room. Um, I was like, could they give us ten more feet of that image? Like, continue it on, and we could take it down into the basement. And uh, so that drum room sits right below this area, and you could just carry it straight through the floor and and uh, um, uh, be able to have a continuation of the image, which I thought was cool. And it gets darker and a little yeah. a little more moody as you get down below. Um, and you know we also have you know this this awesome control room. Uh, we kind of splayed out the walls a little bit to to shape it and, and give it more space. And uh, you know a lot of like LED lighting and, and different things that we could do. Like the, I think the control room in Josh's space is a little bit more subdued and like um, you know traditional maybe. Yeah. Uh, but then like you see the the drum room through there and you see all the the, the artwork. I think it's really great. Yeah, it's visually stunning. Acoustically, again, I use the word perfect because, you know, the studios <laughs> I walk into, it's like, okay, this is exactly what you aim for. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, it's, it's conventional. You've got, your, you've got your vocal booth. You've got your actual control room and then the drum room. But each one has their own little wins where it's addressing multiple things. Um, yeah. And that was, that was the fun part is, like, I mean, on my side at least, tackling all the wall plates, making sure that we were positioning everything to be right. The drum room was just amazing because – I have never approached a studio thinking, what hardware can we put in here that wouldn't affect the aesthetic? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, as a drummer, uh, you're you're forced to work around a bunch of stands, a bunch of cables and uh, mic stands. Um, so as soon as I saw the the time and detail that went into the aesthetic of it, mm -hmm. I instantly had to change my approach as a implementer of, of technology and hardware to make it conducive for A, Josh to move around in the room. Because, I mean, the room is, what are the technical dimensions of that room? Man, it's really not all that big. I think that uh, the the widest it gets over by the drums is uh, maybe 14 feet or something like that, right. 14, 15 feet. And I knew we were going to have a larger footprint for the drums. This is actually the first two-on-the-floor kit that Josh has ever had. Uh, oh, yeah. So now we have a second floor, Tom. Uh, so as soon as he told me that, I was like, okay, we have less space. So I'll, my mind instantly goes to just looking at, drum sets in recording studios with mm -hmm. 100 mic stands around them with a bunch of cables spilling all over the floor. And my that's just my complex, but I'm just sitting there thinking, I don't want to do that. So yeah. I spent a bunch of time just kind of like rendering thoughts and pictures of how we could suspend certain mic stands and whatever. And then I found Triad Orbit. Yeah. And I've, I've used Triad Orbit for, I mean, years in the past, but never to like suspend or figure out how few stands can I use to make the largest impact across the kit. And that drum set, I'm sorry, this is weird for your channel, but I mean, just something that was a massive win for me in that room yeah. was there's I, there's four mic stands in the entire room. Mm -hmm. And again, we did, a, you did a floating floor in the room and then the conduit. So we ran all the cables. There's three pockets underneath that drum set, so all the cables spill up into the kit from mm -hmm. underneath it, so you don't see a single cable wrapped around the, the kit. And then the two overheads, there's actually three overhead mics in the room right now. Two are suspended with Coles 4038 with the Triad Orbit arms, mm -hmm. and then there's a Royer SF12 in the front of the room that's mm -hmm. just kind of out of place yeah. uh, or out of, out, of, out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's amazing to look at these, these photos and... Uh, again, just things that I I, I I I love to look at. It's like, hey, yeah, that is a fully mic drum set with three stands. You don't see a single cable, yep. or in, in the you know just the aesthetic of it. Again, so I'm always trying to find rooms to inspire people. And the last thing I wanted to do was have him dunking you know dunking his head around yeah. mic stands or tripping over cables to get to the kit. So man, no. what a win! Yeah, for real. And and I think that um, you know what's really cool about this project. There's so many like companies that were involved to make it happen like and i would say that all the time like yeah we can come up with a cool acoustical design and and uh make it well isolated but there's so many other people that have to come in i mean obviously we partnered on this but then there's you know the contractor charlie griffey and oh. griffey remodeling 
like as far as an experience with a contractor, I haven't had really a better one. I mean, I've had really good good experiences with contractors over the years, but he just did everything you know as well as I could I could expect. And, um, and then we had like Matt Call with Simplified Acoustics came in did I mean all the the visuals that you see and all the acoustical treatment that was him making that happen and right. and uh we've got you know all the all the gear manufacturers you got the pmc speakers danger fox desk i mean you had control of the over the the gear selection i mean you used so many different brands to make it happen for right. him it was a, a collaborative effort with a lot of people mm -hmm. it's uh just going back to charlie what yeah. was fun about that was, you know, with Tyler's room, we used Triface. And there yeah. was a lot of contractors that worked with Triface that had built studios before. Sure. So that was, like, just part of my comfort of saying, okay, cool. These, all these people know exactly what they're doing because they've done it before. Yeah. Charlie, you know, we met him. Uh, Josh knows him somehow. Yeah, it was – he had referrals from two different people. Um, right. I want to say it was Josh's uncle that referred uh, Charlie. Yeah. Right. But it was Charlie's personal interest into the job that just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked with a lot of contractors. I have, I've got a great contractor at home. I absolutely love him. He's a friend of mine. But he, the reason why I love him is because he puts himself into his work. Yeah. Uh, but you've worked with contractors before where it's a job to them. Yeah. And look, I have, no, I have no problem with that, where you just come in, do your job, do sure. it to the best of your ability, and leave. But Charlie took an absolute interest in what we were doing and did it to the best I've ever seen done. Yeah. Uh, he really blew my blew my mind, and it was cool to just hang out with him too. Yeah, I've never walked into a job site and just like want to hang because yeah. I mean Charlie's just a great dude. <laughs> yeah, so I mean having him on the on the project was just an absolute pleasure. Put my mind at ease too. Yeah, because there's a lot of times where I end up um, supplying a uh, design to someone, and then. It's like, cross your fingers. I hope they pull this <laughs> off. You know, like I remember the first interaction I had with Charlie was actually, um, uh, you know, we were reviewing the drawing set and he had found a small typo, which uh, was inconsequential to the design. But I, I love the fact that he found the typo right. on that page is like on page 37 of our plans. <laughs> I was like, if he's got that level of attention to detail, he, he's going to be awesome. Right. So, yeah, and, and it, great. it was great having him around, too, because, you know, with Tyler's studio, we had two and a half months, whatever. But with Josh's, we were in, in construction for seven months. So I was there more for Josh's, but there was also larger gaps in between mm -hmm. me showing up to just see how everything was getting yeah. done. And again, it was very interesting to work with Charlie because A, he had never built a studio. So he would call me all the time. He's like, okay, yeah. I'm looking at the conduit. Because I mean, especially for the overheads, when I'm trying to explain to someone who does not play drums or does not have a, a, you know, ex a bunch of years in the studios, when I'm trying to explain, hey, hanging microphones over a drum set, I need the conduit to run like this. And he's calling, he's like, he was just so thorough. But yeah. all this to say, I. It was so fluid to have him on the ground who mm -hmm. was just personally interested in the project because yeah. otherwise it, I would have had to show up twice as much. Right. And the only mistake, which I still love, um, was the electrical in front of the desk. Mm -hmm. uh, there, I don't know if there's uh, actually a photo of this, but we, we there's a ton of conduit and a ton of electrical ran in the room because I just yeah. didn't want, again, to run a cable across the floor <laughs> right. to get somewhere. But I showed up in all, there was four gangs of four outlets each on yeah. four different circuits in front of the desk. <laughs> yeah. And I remember looking at Josh, we we're looking at it. He's like, do I really need that many outlets? I'm like, no. 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 <laughs> and we will, we will use maybe three of these plugs, but if we ever need 16, dang, yes, we are we, set. We've got it. We've got it. <laughs> that was funny. But no, that, that was a fluid project. It was just one of those things, especially with the cabling, because, you know, we, we've got wall plates in every room. Uh, obviously, the drums run straight through the floor into the control room. Mm -hmm. The vocal booth, again, with him not being a vocalist, I'm like, okay, what are, what are we going to do in here? And yeah. ironically, its first purpose was to be a, a gaming room for yes. his brother. So yes. I was like, okay, we have to run an HDMI for ADR for Debbie, but we also want to run an <laughs> HDMI in case we want to put a console or something in here. Mm -hmm. So again, like you, as someone who builds studios or does this, you know, whatever, you kind of put yourself in a mindset of, okay, I'm building a recording studio. It's like, oh, actually, we're also doing this for voiceover talent for mm -hmm. Debbie and ADR. So we've got a plate for her, too, in the drum room because ADR, you can't always have a completely dead environment. Right. It's like, okay, this person in the film is standing outside, but it sounds like they're in a closet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we put a plate out in the in the drum room, and then we've got four plates or two plates with four out, uh, inputs each for their podcast yeah. uh, on the back wall on the couch. And then the vocal booth, 
And what was crazy is I, I was like, okay, we've got all the plates done. And I showed up. My team that came and actually did the installation with me was actually Sweetwater. Mm-hmm. I brought my sales engineer, John Kremple. I, I, I love him because he's never really gotten as mad as me as, as you should have. <laughs> because every time I tell him, hey, I got a project. Come with me to Columbus. It'll be fun. He's like, yeah. what are we doing? It's like, ah, we're just, yeah, we got to solder 16 cables. <laughs> Always forgetting that 16 is actually 32, and then I'm always lying to him that it's yeah. not 16, it's 64. Yeah, so, there's many. Yeah, but we showed up with 1,000 feet of cable, and we were still 1,000 feet short by the time we got there. Wow. Because you just you have to just calculate how many runs you're going to make. And I, I remember there was one bad cut that made it so we couldn't finish the project. But we had to come back the next day, and that was also the same day that we tackled the W-2. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this W2 mask connect in the cathedral room. I don't even know. Did we ever land on a technical name for that room? I don't know. I call it mushroom room. The mushroom. It's like, it's got that mushroom guy on there. Yeah. I, I wish there was, I, I hope that they named these people. I bet Dabs Mile has a name for the mushroom guy. You can find out. But it's like, I just, I hope it's like Chad. Yeah. Or yeah. Seth. Just, you know, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, whatever. Sorry, I'm tangent. But <laughs> anywho, uh, the second time we came back, one of the most important things for me and it didn't matter in really any capacity, but we really wanted to be able to track drums in the, I'm just going to call it the mushroom room now. Yeah. Um, you know, so we, we had Charlie, we had told him, I was like, Hey, I need you, you can see the, the chairs that run across the drum. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like, I need you to be able to somehow drill a hole underneath one of those chairs and make a path for me to get to the studio. And, Charlie never said no to me, and I can't believe he didn't because I, I still don't know really how he got through the walls and all the drywall and studs to do it, but he did it. Yeah. Um, but he's like, hey, by the way, it wasn't obviously a straight shot. I think there was there was no 90s, but I think there was like a curve 45, mm-hmm. and you're trying to push 24 channels of XLR cables that had actually been already pre-soldered and had the DB25 <laughs> heads on them. Yeah. So my buddy and I, I mean – John Krempel, we, we sat there and almost gave up, I think, like twice. And I just oh, looked wow. at him. I'm like, look, I don't know if we're ever going to track drums up there. But this is like this. the most important thing right now because I am not taking an L on this. Yes. <laughs> so uh, they were sitting there with this like vat of cable lube and just sitting there pulling on it. I'm like, okay, great. We're going to get the line down here, but we're going to have shredded the cable in the process of doing so. Yeah. But we we were absolutely hell bent on getting yeah. that done that night. That's awesome. And, uh, I'll never forget that it was like we pulled it and finally got it through. It was like nine o'clock at night. And that was it was a I'm sorry. I'm reminiscing on on that victory because that felt so good to get that done. So it's awesome that you got that done because yeah. I, I was I th- I think it's a key feature of the room too. It's like to have a 25 foot ceiling, mostly reflective space to to you know be opposite of what his drum room is down in the basement like you got to right. use it but do you think you will do you I, think he'll ever use it on something i think it's a challenge and a bucket list thing for him because it was funny when we were sitting in the room this is before the artwork was done which is it's it's hard to look at that photo now without the art on the walls right. because like to i remember see when it, it wasn't but it was like white walls it was just so boring but it's it was it's still beautiful but he asked me he's like do you think we could track drums up here and of course you've you've seen i have this tendency to say yes when i actually have no idea if i can do it <laughs> right. uh but i'm like oh yeah for sure we can we can make that happen mm-hmm. lucky that we did and then uh we we brought the drums up and he uh he had the original vessel acrylic blue kit and we brought it up and we set the drums up and he started playing we all just started laughing because it sounds so cool so cool yeah and uh we had brought after everything was set and done you know we have like the initial gear day where we came and set everything up and then there was multiple phases of testing just because the room's complex you Mm -hmm. know not only is it just uh, a studio, but it's a studio that he has to be able to navigate completely by himself. Yeah. So we had to build this like mirroring station of his computer in the drum room for him to be able to track. I remember that was a day in itself, mm-hmm. getting the right kind of screens and making sure he could wirelessly control everything. But it was one of the last trips that I made from a gear day perspective. We set the kit up, set microphones up and tracked up there. And it sounds awesome. Yeah. So it's one of the piles doesn't traditionally have very lively drums, mm-hmm. but I know that it is in Josh's like back pocket is like a trick to put that in somehow. Yeah. So I will be so happy someday when yeah. I find <laughs> out that there's maybe a single second or whatever 
you know how they can like EQ and filter drums sure. like a swelling or something. It's like uh, there yeah. has to be a moment where like they you record a it. triangle up there. Well, anything, Maybe. yeah, Just something. It's, like, it's it's gotta it's gotta exist. A because I've spent hours pulling cable after like blind optimism of trying to make that happen. Like it, we gotta attract something yeah. up there. Well, I remember down in the drum room too when uh, Mike Peacock joined us yeah. and, and we were trying to get some drum sounds out of the space and. Um, it didn't take very long, you know, like he, he is 15 minutes or so. And he's like, man, I didn't have to do a whole lot. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the foundation is, is solid. It's a uh, Lynx Aurora conversion. So you're, you're going to be great there. Grace M905 is our monitor controller. Just uh, has nothing to do with the drums, but, um, it's all Neve. Uh, when we were creating the studio, I had asked Josh, I'm like, what are your favorite drum tones? Mm -hmm. And he's like in general or like with tournament pilots, because, you know, the sound of his drums has evolved a bit and it just kind of depends on like what era versus what, you know, the album was. And I just asked him, I was like, what are your favorite like sounds of your drums and what are your favorite albums with drums on them? And what we found is it was like 100% of the time. It felt like it was, it was just like, oh, it's always Neve consoles yeah. or Neve front end. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, okay, let's go, let's go Neve. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to put a console in there because we could, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't have been usable for him if he's just down there by himself. Right. So I decided to go the 500 series. We've got five 17s. We got two of those for snare and kick. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the kits on 511s, 1176 for overheads. But, you know, it was, we brought in Mike Peacott. He's a senior sales engineer, artist relations guy at Sweetwater that I've been working with forever. Uh, probably the most knowledgeable person in the room at all times at Sweetwater mm -hmm. when it comes to studio stuff. So he's, he's kind of been like my shoulder to cry on in a lot of times. So when it was time to finalize the room, I just asked Mike to come out, A, to tune the room with the PMCs because we obviously wanted to create the multiple environments. Mm -hmm. And the the PMCs that we had bought have built in DSP, and we're using that DSP to make, make absolute micro adjustments to the speakers in the room, but then also create the multiple mixing environments. But we also had him dial in drum tone, as you just mentioned. But yeah. it was I, I remember the process was like 15 minutes. Josh was drumming, and Mike is just sitting there dialing the knobs and getting game staging set right and then just doing the basic EQ and texture that you get with Neve. And it was like 15 minutes. He just sits back in the chair. He's like, yeah, sounds great. And Josh came in, and we played the tracks back. And I'm like, it can't be that easy. Yeah. But it's like, well, when you have a great sound in a room, great yeah. microphones, and and you know, great front end, it, it yeah, the it, it spoke for itself. It was shocking. We all just kind of laughed. It was like, oh, I wish there was something more we could do right. here. But this is, from a foundational standpoint, you're going to get great takes here. Right. So yeah, yeah, that was that was a fun, that was a fun moment. Yeah, yeah. Was, I mean, the whole thing. I mean, it's just turned into like the whole basement is just like a place I'd never leave the basement <laughs> if I was if I was there. I mean, he's got the boxing ring outside, which uh, in our our videos, you know, the interview we did it in the in boxing the ring. Um, but uh, and he's got a home theater down there. Some, you know, just all sorts of cool things. Uh, it's a little bit of a playground. But uh, speaking of the the boxing ring, I mean, look how how menacing we look. Yeah, I was this. going hard in that. I, I mean, still that, feel ridiculous just wearing socks. But yeah, the still. fact that you have socks on is, <laughs> is something we we probably should edit out. But. Um, Put some clown shoes on, right. there, maybe. Uh. I remember Chad, he was a videographer there. Well, we had a lot of people out there, but Chad, he's like, hey, look tough. I'm like, yeah, Mark, I don't, yeah. or not Mark, yeah, Mark was there too, but I was like, yeah, that's not something I really do. But they yeah. showed me that photo. I was like, I'll let that pass. That's yeah, okay. it looks pretty cool, even though I can definitely say I've never stood that way yeah. intentionally uh, in my life. And then uh, the team, you know, uh, Charlie there on the left, we mentioned him a lot, and uh, in Josh and you and me on the couch. And then most importantly, most importantly we got we got Jim, the dog, um, who in the video helped us out by putting our sticker yeah. on, on the pole, that red pole that's in the control room. Jim was the best boy. I mean, he was a part of everything. It was hilarious how many times he would just – insert himself into yep. literally every moment of that process, just rolling in dust, yeah. <laughs> laying down on the floor exactly where I wanted to take my next step. But he was a welcome partner in the whole project. And he's just, awesome. He, he made me hate my dog. <laughs> 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 like, Jim, you're so well behaved. My dog sucks. <laughs> so I was like, I, I awesome. always tell Josh that I'm like, ah, man, I have, I have a spastic, like crazy puggle and she's she's still got that puppy energy so i really hope it goes but jim is, yeah jim's jim's chill yeah he's a good boy and then uh really cool uh that mix magazine put uh the the studio on the cover of yeah. of last last month's uh or this month's um i don't know when this will come out but yeah, right. it was the uh the uh, uh august issue 
of, of mix. What and an amazing, just, uh, I mean, I've been reading mix forever and you go into any commercial studio, it's like going into the dentist's office and it's like, how old are these magazines? But yeah. you know, mix is on the, on the end tables of every major studio. You can go through Sweetwater, they're everywhere. So I've been reading mix forever. And again, just to have any part of anything that ended up on the front cover is bucket list thing that I never even, you know, yeah. went for, but it was just really cool to have it showcase. And, you know, Josh, I told him, I was like, Hey, you're going to get the cover of mix. And he's like, I've heard of mix. And he's like, this is, this is cool. Right. I was like, no, this is really cool. Yeah. It's like your, your studio is being presented to a lot of people that take studios very seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the outpour of support and love for the space has been incredible since that came out. And yeah. so many people have reached out to me and it's like one of those things that I didn't want to like, get really excited about because it just feels like it's not really my studio but you know it's it just kind of reassures that the work you're doing is great and being respected because i mean it's an amazing space yeah it, it was awesome it's fun to work on it with you and all the jobs we've done our next goal is we gotta get another mix cover like, no, we gotta let's, figure out let's some do other it. artists that we can work with and um yeah it's just always fun to, to hang out with you as well and i just know working with you that Everything's going to get taken care of on the tech side of things. I can worry about the acoustics, and it's a good team. So. Yeah, that's amazing. And, Gavin, it's it's one of those – you have a – for me, with Neat, I'm always finding opportunities to, like, create another opportunity for my clients. So it's like, okay, I work with you on the road a lot with your tour. What does your studio look like? Yeah. And then they open up to you to show you their home and show you their workflow. And that's something I focus on is preserving their work environment but also taking them to another level – and working with you is just so fluid in that because, I, A, I completely feel comfortable always turning my clients over to you and then also knowing that you're going to give them exactly what they're looking for and then always far exceeding their expectations. So nice. it's, uh, it's been a ton of fun over the years. Thank you, man. Well, and again, I appreciate you joining us on the podcast. It's been super fun. Thanks for um, having me. And uh, we'll, have you, we'll have you back another time when we have another studio we've done. Look forward to it. Thanks, okay. Kevin. Appreciate it. That's been another episode of our podcast. Uh, thank you for being part of the Sound Project. If you have any other ideas for future episodes, feel free to email us at info at and we'll see you next week.